Okay. Well, we're going to get started here. Uh, we'll get started a little slow to allow those uh, people who are logging in a chance uh, to you know, get registered here and figure out their video. So my name is Adam Hauser. I am the director of collegians for CFAC. And I also wear many hats for CFAC as well, doing things like this. I have the, uh, the pleasure and the honor of moderating tonight's uh, great discussion. We're super excited uh, to you know, hold this discussion about a really important topic that really needs some more attention in the media, attention in our uh, discussion of public policy. So we're super excited to have both Mark Morano and James Taylor uh, here with us. Um, you know, CFACT uh, does talks like this frequently. This might become a, a regular thing or a CFACT truth talk. Um, so look for more of these in the future. Um, and we love partnering uh, with great folks like Heartland as well. So as people, uh, as you're all logging in here, I would encourage you if, uh, you know, wherever you're watching from, just share on the chat, you know, uh, wherever you're watching from so we can connect in that way. That's a fun way to know where we're all from. So that will be great. If you have a question as we get to the uh, end of the discussion, because Mark and James are each gonna give a, a short presentation, a short discussion uh, about the, uh, the topic of you know, how radical environmentalists are you know, really using this coronavirus crisis to push or try to push their agenda. And this is kind of the blueprint that they're looking for uh, to, for the future climate crisis claims that they're pushing. Um, whatever question you have for that, I encourage you to put it in the Q&A section uh, at the bottom of your Zoom tab there, and uh, the chat can be uh, left for other things. We'll try to get as to, many, to as many of them, excuse me, as possible, uh, and you know, just say you know maybe where you're, what state or what country you're asking it from, and and that'll be great, great way to connect. So, uh, eight oh two here. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, so I'm going to introduce our two uh, awesome panelists here. So I'll start uh, with Mark Morano of our own CFACT. Uh, Mark is the founding editor of the award-winning uh, website, climatedepot.com. It's a project of CFACT, the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow. Uh, he is co-author uh, and star of the film, Climate Hustle, uh, and also of the upcoming sequel, Climate Hustle 2, that's gonna be coming out soon. I served as communications director for Senator James Inhofe and for the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. He's appeared on many networks talking about uh, the climate issue, environmental issues, uh, we're excited to have him part of this. And uh, our other panelist, James Taylor, he is the president of the Heartland Institute. Uh, he is also the director of Heartland's Arthur B. Robinson Center uh, for Climate and Environmental Policy. Uh, he's the former managing editor of Environment and Climate News. That's a national monthly publication uh, devoted to sound science and free market environmentalism. Uh, he also regularly writes a column for Forbes magazine and appears on their website and has also appeared on uh, many uh, network shows and, and radio shows and things like that, discussing these important energy and environment uh, policy issues. So we're super excited to have both of you with us. Thank you for agreeing to do this. Um, so like I said, how we're gonna do it, I will pass it off to you first, Mark, and you can give your uh, presentation, then we'll go to James, and then we'll go, uh, I have some questions for you myself because I'm super excited for that. And we'll try to get to as many uh, audience questions as possible. So without further ado, Mark, take it away. And uh, thanks for being here. Mark, you got to unmute yourself first. That's an important part of this. So. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Go. It's an honor to be here. Um, and I'm happy to be partnering up with uh, Heartland Institute and James Taylor on this. I think I'd like to see a lot more of this. This is fantastic. Uh, this is, you know, what can I say? The, the, the virus and the lockdowns uh in many ways i think are going to be have a more of an impact on americans and those around the globe than anything that happened on 9 11. uh this is truly a sea change in american politics economics culture life uh and so you would imagine there's going to be a lot of shifts and changes in the climate debate because of that so what i'm going to do tonight is explain what the climate and environmental community how they're a reacting to this how they're a likely to adapt to it and how they're a likely to go move going forward on this. And I think it's going to be some um, uh, some good discussion here. I'm looking forward to questions from the media, from other listeners out there, viewers. Um, I think this is a, um, a very important conversation because whenever you have a seismic shift 
in politics, culture, economics, government policy, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot to absorb and a lot to figure out. So what we have here so far, and this is almost eerie you know, these, with, the, with the virus, which obviously, you know, this, the lockdowns and, and a lot of the uh, approach was a World War II style fighting of the virus. We're all in this together. This is what the climate community has preached for decades about global warming and particularly in recent last couple of years, particularly about the Green New Deal. So you have a, a AOC, Akasha Cortez calling for the World War II style engagement. You have Greta Thunberg out there, the school strikes. What I think the number one thing that's happened here is, first of all, the climate activists are in complete and total shock that government and the world has reacted in, in many ways, a unified way to this to the viral threat. And they have literally um, just dusted, knocked climate off the table. And the, and the climate activists, for lack of a better word, are jealous. They are in shock and they are in awe. They are in shock that all the stuff they've been essentially preaching, the World War II style approach, lowering emissions, we're all in this together, government action, getting people to actually mobilize and, and react, happened literally almost overnight with the virus and they couldn't get bupkis from the public before. They couldn't even get bupkis from democratic presidents with democratic congresses in years past. You know, anything actually passing Congress, even mild things by their book, by client like cap and trade. So they've been in awe at this. So the first thing they're doing is I think they're jealous. Second thing is they're praising this. Now I'm gonna go through and show, I did a special report on this uh, you know, is this the future environmentalists want? Uh, last week at Climate Depot, and I think it was like 38 page report. You can go to climatedepot.com. It's at the very top of the website. I'm going to now share a couple of the key quotes, a couple of the key reactions that we've been seeing uh, with, with the uh, climate uh, community. This is the copy of the report. I assume it's on the screen now for everyone to see. Fantastic for the climate. Uh, and this is, if you like living, my quote was, if you like living under the coronavirus uh, mandated lockdowns, you'll love living under a climate emergency. Now, why do I say that? It's not just, you know, cheap rhetoric, although, you know, everyone likes cheap rhetoric. That's not what this is. Here's some quotes. Neither Greenpeace nor Greta Thunberg have achieved so much in favor of the health in such a short planet. This is the climate activist, uh, Martin Lopez Cordera. We have the uh, Oxford University professor saying the, the climate is a huge benefit of these lockdowns. We have the former UN climate chief, Christina Figueres, talking about the incredible responsibility uh, in this situation and that the solutions to both the coronavirus and climate uh, are essentially, they need to be converged, is one of her quotes uh, on this, and because we cannot afford to, to jump out of the frying plan into the raging fire of climate. So they're trying to use the climate issue. The UN Secretary General sees an opportunity to rebuild the climate economy along sustainable lines. And you go down here, the United Nations Green Climate Fund, this is an opportunity to bolster climate action. The UK Guardian editorial staff, uh, the mass shutdowns could provide a model for imposing harsh actions to curb emissions. Uh, UN's environmental chief, let's not let this crisis go to waste. It's a chance to offer us a chance to do capitalism differently. Uh, I won't give you too many more quotes here. You can go to the report and read them. Um, but one of my favorites, though, was Eric Holtice, the, the meteorologist, very uh, intense climate campaigner, actually said uh, in, a, in, a, in his tweet that if we go through essentially 10 more years, we could actually meet our U.S. obligation to the U.N. Paris Agreement. So Voila, 10 more years of lockdown, and we can make the United Nations UN Paris Agreement happy. So what I went through the port and did is showed what happened here. Climate activists hated air travel. They promoted flight shaming. Guess what? Now the airline industry wiped out. They hated economic growth. At Climate Depot and in our film upcoming, Climate Hustle 2, uh, we talk about the degrowth movement and planned recessions to fight global warming. Well, what is a lockdown? It's an unplanned recession, but they still like the results. And what is the Green New Deal? If you think about it, it's really just one giant national planned recession. Uh, they, they hated eating out at restaurants. We had the UN climate chief, Christina Figueres, say last year that we should treat meat eaters as though they're... Um, 
uh, smokers and banished them in restaurants to the far corner. They didn't want people eating meat in restaurants. Now the restaurant industry is being wiped out and essentially shut down except for carry out and delivery. They called for an end to fossil fueled cars. We had Democrat candidate Andrew Yang running for president say that he wants to abolish the pre essentially private car ownership and have a roving fleet of electric cars instead. Now, not only is there no demand for cars, but you have the oil industry tanking. AOC, very happy about that. So continuing on, they wanted to stop meat eating. We talked about that. Meat packing plants closing. Everything they called for. Excess consumption, uh, which was a big part of the climate movement. Now only essential stores are open. They wanted kids to skip school to accomplish all of this. Now all the schools are actually uh, shut down. So as I went through this report, I was just it was an amazing thing to watch because everything that they wanted to see in society has now essentially become a temporary reality. And now many of the top UN leadership, many of the climate activists, people like John Kerry, Al Gore, they can't avoid jumping on this bandwagon. And they are a big part. I'm not saying they're all happy that this happened, but they see this as an opportunity they can't wait to exploit. And they are going to, and I'll talk about this in a little bit. My seven minutes are up, but, but they are going to use now, the, the virus scares going forward to bolster climate action. We're already seeing this. The UN you know, Species Report was last summer, where they just came out with an update yesterday, basically saying that if we want to tackle future viruses, we've got to tackle uh, you know, climate change. And now you're going to have all sorts of funding, uh, new studies. And you're going to, like John Kerry has already said, you know, this is you know, global warming. We'll celebrate new viruses because as the Arctic melts, it's going to release old pathogens and toxins and et cetera. So this is an issue where the, the, the climate activists are actually very well positioned to pounce and try to make this reality. So with that, I'll end my opening statement and I guess turn it back to you, Adam, and for James's statement. Thank you for this opportunity. Great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, awesome expose there. Uh, you know, a lot of radical quotes, a lot of extreme things happening. So uh, we're looking forward to delving more into that through the questions later. So James, I'm going to pass it over to you. We're super excited to hear your talk. Uh, and so take it away, James. Well, thank you very much, Adam. Uh, it truly is a pleasure to be here with CFAX. Longtime friend of mine, Mark Morano, friend and one of my heroes. Mark has been setting the record straight on climate change for many, many years. And without the efforts of Mark and CFACT, I think we'd have quite a, quite a bit fewer freedoms in this country right now. We'd have more restrictions on our freedoms. We'd be stuck with, affordable, uh, with expensive and unreliable energy sources. And for everyone that's paying attention here this evening, thank you for giving up your evening to take part. And I encourage you that if you uh, also share our concern for freedom, that you'll consider donating to CFACT and, and helping uh, CFACT continue to spread the truth. So as much as it's, it's good to be here with, with Mark and Adam and everyone here, it's still, it's, it's a time that's very concerning. This is a very perilous time for freedom. Back seven months ago, we were told that we could expect up to 2 million deaths from coronavirus. And fortunately, those models appear to have been greatly overstated because now uh, we're being told perhaps 60,000, maybe 100,000. Still quite a tragedy, but nowhere near the 2 million deaths. When those models made those predictions, it, it really gave me pause because I know how in the climate change debate, people program models and the models are only as good, the outcome and predictions are only as accurate as the assumptions that go into the programming. And for climate change, we've seen that the models predicted, for example, the United Nations uh, first assessment report, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they said we can expect 0 0.3 degrees Celsius of warming per decade. That was in 1990. Here we are 30 years later, and we've seen less than half of that warming. So when we saw the models predicting such a great death toll, uh, I was hoping that the models would be just as wrong as they are for climate change, and fortunately they have been. We were told at the time that we needed these lockdowns, shelter in place, et cetera, because of such a high death toll. And it wasn't that these impositions on our freedoms were going to reduce the number of deaths. It would merely make, it would merely flatten the curve in the sense that we wouldn't have an overwhelming number of people inundating our healthcare facilities and our medical professionals at the very beginning of the crisis. 
we were told that we'd still have the same amount of cases, the same amount of deaths, except that we wouldn't have that spike in the beginning, which we couldn't handle. Well, the, the curve has been flattened. We appear to be on the downside of the slope, and yet those restrictions on our freedom are still in place. These are restrictions where we have police officers going to people's doors, citing parents because they allow their child to go next door and play with a friend. These are police officers that handcuff and arrest a father for playing catch with his daughter in a public park. It's just the two of them, father and daughter. I live in Florida, here in Florida, I've had to deal with curfews where we've been told we can't go outside after 9 p.m. What does that remotely have to do with stopping coronavirus? Uh, since where are there the large congregations of people all through the night? It appears that government, appear, government is seeking to restrict our freedoms merely because it can and because it fears criticism from the left if they go one step short of what any other governor or what any other state does. But our freedoms are very important. And especially when we look at a situation now where as tragic as the COVID-19 situation is, we appear to at least have peaked, perhaps beyond the downside, and nowhere near what they predicted for us. If we're looking at 60, 70,000 deaths, heck, heck, let's say 80,000 deaths, that is just for equivalence, that's about two flu seasons. Approximately 40,000 people each year die from the flu in the United States. And the question is, is it worth shutting down all of our freedoms, shutting down society, likely putting us into a great depression if we continue this, to basically avoid two flu seasons? And now that is a, that is a very serious uh, consequence, those deaths that occur. But again, the trade-off is something that we need to consider. And it doesn't mean that people are callous about people's lives. In fact, we care about people's lives. We want people to live their lives. We want people to be able to go outside and exercise and, and not die because they're out of shape, not die because, uh, heck, I'll tell you myself, I put on 15 pounds in the last seven weeks because I can't go to the fitness center. Um, that's not good for people's health. I drove by a, a little league field just yesterday and I saw the sign announcing signups. The sign hadn't been changed since early March. We've got a whole generation of young people who can and should be outside exercising and learning good habits for health and enjoying their lives instead are shut down. It's something we need to consider about when we look at the updated models, which again, who knows how accurate they are, but we see in terms of real life data that the curve has flattened. It's one, it's one thing to, it's one thing to care about people's lives. It's another thing to care about how we live our lives. And it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't cross the realm of poor judgment for people to say, it is important for us to have freedom. Freedom is a part of our life. Getting to the topic that we're talking about this evening, it's very concerning to hear what some folks from the climate establishment and even outside the climate establishment, but for example, from the World Health Organization are saying regarding uh, the COVID-19 response and climate change. Mark presented a list and I'm just gonna provide a few and then we'll turn it over to question and answer. But there have been two World Health Organization officials and by the way, we've written this up and we've summarized it on climaterealism.com. I hope you'll check out that site. That's a new site the Heartland Institute launched last month where basically every day we are providing updates debunking the media's climate scare of the day. But on two separate occasions, we had World Health Organization officials making outrageous statements about climate change regarding coronavirus. In one, the statement was that climate change may make current or future pandemics worse. From everything we know, influenza, which is what we feared for the next great pandemic, we know that influenza is assisted by cold temperatures. Warm temperatures inhibit its spread and make pandemics uh, less severe. Coronavirus, we're not sure if the same will occur. It's quite possible that warmer temperatures will have the same impact. At worst, it'll be neutral. It's an outrageous statement for the World Health Organization to make, apparently just a pander to climate activists. Another WHO official said, and here's a quote, what the COVID crisis exposes is that we can do things differently. We must not go back to the status quo. We cannot do that. To say that we should have a permanent current situation of lockdowns and shutdowns and restrictions on freedoms is just unbelievable that people might accept that. That's coming from the World Health Organization. And I'll give you one more quote here before we switch over to Q&A, but Mark mentioned Christiana Figueres, who had long been the head climate official with the United Nations. And in, we summarize this in climate realism as well. You can find our article on this, but here's her quote. 
Global challenges also require individuals to change their behavior, which, may, which many people have shown can happen quickly. These changes are only effective if all members of society participate. To tackle climate change, we as individuals need to change our diets, consumption patterns, ways of interacting with one another, and how we travel. Our approach to COVID-19 can also help tackle climate change. These people are looking at an opportunity to cement permanently these restrictions on our freedom, these death knells to our economy, all in the name of gaining more control for their international organizations and to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. This is a very perilous time for freedom in our country and around the world. And I hope that everybody on this uh, video conference today will take this to heart and do your own research and let people know how you think. So thank you, Adam, and thank you for everybody who's here. All right, well, James, thanks so much for that uh, awesome presentation. Uh, as James alluded to, we're going to move to questions now. I've got a few uh, moderators privilege here that I'm gonna pitch to both James and Mark to kind of get the conversation started. Uh, and then we're gonna go to your questions, both the ones you're submitting live now uh, and the ones you submitted to us uh, prior to that. And for all those who haven't asked a question yet, you can do so via the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom tab. We'll try to get as many as we can uh, before our time runs out here. So uh, the first question I've got here is from Mark, and it is, how do climate activists view handling all the attention and government shutdowns caused by the virus? Well, right now, they see it, again, as an op a crisis opportunity. They don't want the crisis to go to waste. And uh, we both quoted Christina Figueres. She's a central figure in this. She's the architect of the UN Paris Agreement. Her other big uh, quote from a few years back was, we seek a centralized transformation that will make life on planet Earth very different for everyone, a new economic model. So this was Christina Figueres as a UN climate chief. What is this but a, uh, you know, a centralized transformation of, of our culture. This lockdown, as James was alluding to, is all the hallmarks of totalitarianism. You have neighbor turning on neighbor, New York City mayor, LA mayor, encouraging snitching of you know, citizen against citizen in service of the state. Uh, you have the, you know, the, the goon squad police out there harassing moms and dads for just normal activity. I can't imagine you know, police unions or anyone who you know, is, 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 is not rolling their eyes when they see what some of these police officers have been up to and trying to carry out these insane rules. It's also exposed many governors as petty despots. And I'm thinking of blue state governors in particular here. Uh, you know, uh, particularly in places like Michigan and places like uh, New York and places like Virginia uh, and, and, and others which you know, have been just reveling in this. So I think the climate activists are going to jump all over every aspect, as we've mentioned, as James eloquently laid out. And they want these to continue. And in fact, you know, there's many quotes. One of the quotes was Teen Vogue, you know, essentially. Uh, Teen Vogue, which is the youth climate activists featuring them saying, this is a model. We need to essentially keep this going. So they want to keep these restrictions on and they just want to morph from virus to climate. Thank you for that, Mark. Uh, next question I have is for James. Uh, and that's going to be, uh, there are plenty of stories in the media each week linking the Wuhan virus with climate change. Uh, what is the overall kind of goal, the overall story here? Is global warming making the coronavirus pandemic worse? Straight up. I'm glad you asked that because we are seeing an increasing number of media articles day after day making, making that link, sometimes implicitly rather than explicitly, but nevertheless making clear that they want readers to believe that climate change makes, makes the coronavirus and other pandemics worse. And as I mentioned earlier, what we do know, I mean, the reason why flu season is in the winter is because colder temperatures inhibit the spread of influenza. In the Southern Hemisphere, flu season is in July, August, June, July, August, their winter. And there, there are a, a few different reasons for this, but this is something that's not in dispute. For the coronavirus, scientists are still looking to uh, ascertain whether the same impact of warmer temperatures uh, will, will affect coronavirus. But that's why we hear about perhaps a second wave in the fall. The reason why they say the fall is because they expect that here in the summer, it's going to be harder for coronavirus to spread from person to person. So the long and short of it is this. 
if humans are causing some warming to the planet, and if we have earlier summers, early arrivals of summer and uh, later arrivals of fall, this is something that inhibits the spread of coronavirus. It's going to reduce the death toll. And it's something that is the complete opposite of what we're hearing in the media. And it's very concerning that folks in the media are so intent on spinning a narrative, regardless of what happens in the real world, that they will twist and turn 180 degrees what's happening in the real world compared to what they're reporting. But the long and short of it is this, if there's going to be any impact of warming temperatures, of global warming, of climate change on coronavirus or other epidemics and pandemics, it's going to make them less frequent and less severe. I would just like to add, the, the climate studies themselves go back and forth. James is actually right. Even on malaria, dengue fever, the studies predicting more malaria, less malaria, more dengue fever, less, less dengue fever. It goes back and forth, but he's absolutely right. A warming world kills, uh, the warming times, warm times kill the virus. One of the greatest follies we're doing is keeping people inside, especially in urban areas where if one member of the family gets it, it spreads rapidly throughout the family. Whereas in a normal situation, you would be outside, especially that's why the rates go lower because you're not all cooped up together. You're generally outside doing more things. Windows are open, fresh air, sunshine. These are all virus killers. So it's been a, um, uh, it's, it's been a just a lot of stuff turned on its head, uh, you know, with the media claims and a lot of the activist claims when it comes to this virus. And let me add one more thing, if I may. Uh, some of the stories I'm seeing in the media assert that by deforestation, by development of land, yes. by shrinking uh, the amount of land that's left for nature, this is one of the reasons why we're going to have more epidemics and pandemics as you're bringing some of these species closer together, the human interaction, uh, with factors that may cause epidemics and pandemics. Let's assume for the sake of argument that that's true. If that is true, the worst thing we can do in that regard is switch to an economy that's powered by wind turbines and solar panels. For example, a study by Harvard University researchers just recently who believe in a climate crisis, they noted that if we were to go to a 100% wind powered economy right now, just for electricity, it would require covering one third of the United States with wind turbines. I mean, think about that. Think about all the environmental destruction you'd have to do to cover a third of the United States with wind turbines. And if we electrify transportation, like the climate activists are, are frequently asserting, then you'd probably be looking at half the country. In the United States and all over the world, if we're imposing these land intensive, environment destroying energy sources, we are gonna make those factors worse that we're told uh, make coronavirus or, and other epidemics and pandemics more likely to occur. And I'm sorry, sorry, Adam, I just had to add one thing. I, I, James is 100% right. It's ass backwards for this. And I see this from the United Nations. This is, well, we're interfering more with nature. We're getting closer. We're, we're getting, we're inter going close in all this contact and it's causing, no. The history of human civilization has been at one with nature until fossil fuels came along and lifted us out of that. If anything, fossil fuels, a modern way of living, remove us from nature, put us in air conditioned sky rise, away, long far away from jungles and pathogens and, and disease and, and animal bites and, and, and insects. So the exact opposite. If you want to reduce the idea of pathogens coming, you'd want more fossil fuels, more development, not a, a, a harken back to a bygone era when we lived in nature. So I just think when I got so angry when I see these UN claims and these other climate activists claiming that, that somehow because we're advanced on nature, there's more viruses. It's the opposite. The more we've removed ourselves through fossil fuels, the less chance we have of these kind of pathogens. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that uh, that passion you're channeling, Mark, is you know something we're all we're all feeling here. Right? And a few right. curse this words is, don't hurt to throw in. <laughs> if this is a if this is a live auditorium thing, I think you get a lot of applause. You know, so, <laughs> just to pad your ego a little bit there. So, um, moving right along here, I've got a few more questions myself for you, but I'm going to get to some audience questions first, and then I'll try to get back to some of the ones I had, and I'll try to mix it in the best I can here. So, the first audience question. Uh, that I had. This is submitted to us uh, from Kerry Brown down in Florida. Uh, he says, please give me your thoughts on how fear and its interplay with the precautionary principle might have some applicability in this flu crisis and this Wuhan virus crisis um, as taken from the global warming alarmist playbook. 
I, if you don't mind, I'll just I'll try to do a short answer here. Sure. Crashly Kinsmill, as far as I know, was early 1970s. It came about, I believe, from Germany. And it's the idea that you just avoid any risk whatsoever. In fact, you know, this has gotten to the point now where, you know, if you really believe every human life is worth saving and you try to, you know, I understand the concept, but why not have a national speed limit at 10 miles an hour? In other words, if all these people calling for endless lockdowns in round two and three of future lockdowns, if we had a national speed limit at 10, highway fatalities would drop dramatically. If you favor a 20 mile an hour speed limit, a 55 or beyond, then you are killing people. You are allowing slaughter on the highways and you don't care about human life. At some point we accept risk and this has crushed us. It's, it's gotten everyone, it's weaponized a death count. It's weaponized a virus. It's, you know, I'm very disappointed. Costco has this rule now where everyone must wear masks and you say, oh, well, that's a corporation. They can make that decision. It's not, you don't have to shop there. Well, you pretty much do when only a few of the big corporations are going to survive a prolonged lockdown. So this is the victory of fear over common sense with a lot of our policies right now. Right, and um, thank you for the question, Kerry. My good friend, Kerry Brown, by the way, nice to, nice to see you uh, tuning in. The, the precautionary principle, as Mark mentioned, would, would put fear above everything else. And sometimes that fear, the precautionary principle itself causes problems or deaths. For example, the, the lockdowns that we've had, if people are not, as I mentioned earlier, if you're banned from going to your fitness center, uh, people are not getting the exercise, they need to stay healthy. And people who, who have worked out from time to time in the past know it's a lot easier to keep exercising than to start and stop, start and stop and start again. It's difficult to do. Uh, people are developing more sedentary habits. People who have mental health issues are likely to see an exacerbation of that being cooped up in their own homes. Uh, as Mark mentioned, um, yes, you know, there, there are things, driving cars, for example, that cause deaths uh, every day and every year. But we accept that because it's a part of living a life uh, that is vibrant, that is enjoyable. So we have, number one, we have some hidden harms uh, that occur when we have these precautionary principle uh, instances, such as lockdown here. And number two, we're, we're going to face death no matter what we do. There's a chance of that. doesn't mean we're callous to, to, uh, to the people that are dying under coronavirus. Hopefully we'll We'll be able to have a vaccine soon, or hopefully we'll have medication that'll treat it soon. But the fact of the matter is, people do need to, have, to live a life that's worth living. And the proposed solution can't present as many harms or damages as it can, or it's not worth it. And one final note, as Kerry mentioned in his question about fear, this is what collectivists prey upon, is fear. People fear climate change because it's something they don't know what it is. We fear the unknown, we fear change. I remember as a, as a 12 year old in 1979, watching the New Year's Eve ball come down. And I remember just being filled with fear, anxiety. This is a whole new decade. Who knows what could happen? I knew the 1970s. Well, you look back, the 1980s were a heck of a lot better for this country than the 1970s, but it's something I feared. And people fear that and, and the collectivists prey upon it for climate change, uh, for the restrictions on coronavirus that are disproportionate to the harms and for many other things as well. Yeah. And by the way, it's the same model. You know, when current reality fails to alarm, make scarier and scarier predictions. That applies in climate. Classic example is polar bears. As the numbers swell to record numbers, how do you create alarm? Well, it's much worse for the polar bear. How is that possible? Well, our predictions of 50 to 100 years are now much worse than they were just five years ago. Same thing here with uh, the coronavirus now. They're worrying, warning of second and third wave. This could, might, may happen. Keep the fear alive. You can keep the lockdowns. You can only maybe let off a little and then just crack down again. These governors, the health bureaucracy in Washington, love it. This is their shining moment. This is what they wait for. Again, if they were in charge of speed limits, we'd have a 10 mile an hour national speed limit. Why? Because as a health bureaucrat and a medical medical health expert, you have to save lives. You can't allow that. We don't want them running the country. The lowest moments of the Trump administration was when Larry Kudlow went on, I think it was Fox News or CNBC, and he actually said, well, the economy is going to take this hit, this hit. When are you going to reopen? Well, that's up to the doctors to decide. He said the medical, you know, he basically ceded the authority of the executive branch of the presidency to the unelected bureaucracy of the medical health bureaucrats. I want to see the Trump administration recover quickly on this. Great points, guys. 
Our next question is from a Paul Saunders in Pennsylvania. Now I'm going to do my best to uh, put this qu question concisely. Uh, he says, author and uh, philosopher Ayn Rand argued that a rational morality must hold each person's life as the standard of value for that person. And he asks, uh, since environmentalists are essentially granting animals, plants, the earth, that value uh, on equal or even greater playing field than those of humans and human needs of late, um, you know, are you putting forward, what ideas can we use? What arguments can we use to counter that, uh, that false idea that uh, trees, plants, animals have that equal moral life footing to those of human beings? Uh, well, real quick, I, say, I interviewed Peter Singer, the bioethicist from Princeton years ago, and he's a famous animal rights activist. But what never made sense about this whole animal rights thing is they want people and animals essentially to be equal. And this is a lot of, you know, the, the, you, know you don't need animals, you don't need animal byproducts, you, animals have all these rights. But at the same time, they don't stop animals from eating other animals. Until they stop lions and other carnivores from eating other animals, how can they then say, because in a way they're putting animals above humans because they're saying humans can't engage in that behavior. We're equal with animals, but animals are allowed to do this. Humans aren't. By implication, they're saying humans can think it through and don't want to eat animals, so we have a higher calling. The animal rights movement never made sense on this, but I'll, I'll let James handle the rest of the question. Excellent, and, and I'm, I'm glad that question was asked. Um, like you, Mark, uh, I travel around quite a bit speaking uh, to uh, public meetings, speaking uh, to legislators, et cetera. And when I have the time, I love to get out in the wilderness. I don't care where I go. I love to see and be in nature. I believe strongly that people should be good stewards of the environment. What's happened, however, is that uh, the climate activists ha have, again, skewed what it means to be protecting nature. So for example, as I mentioned earlier, we would have to cover a third of the United States with wind turbines just to uh, meet today's electricity needs with wind power. And if we add transportation, probably half the United States. That is incredibly devastating to the environment. It's not that we have to choose between environmental stewardship and a strong, healthy economy with individual freedom. No, they can go hand in hand. And really, they naturally do go hand in hand, except when you have these collectivist restrictions imposed by the climate left uh, on, on our society. And one other example, uh, Paul Dreesen, who is a CFAC scholar, uh, wrote a policy brief uh, that the Heartland Institute published recently. So again, we have this synergy with Heartland and CFAC, which I love. But his policy brief addressed the environmental harms that the Green New Deal would impose upon America. And it's a devastating indictment of what would happen to our environment under these programs. And I'll give one other source for those who are less inclined to be free marketers, uh, Michael Mann's recent movie. I encourage everyone to watch it where he shows and documents how the, the people that we're told are the green energy future, the renewable energy industry, they're in it for to be rent seekers, to get money, and their actions do more harm to the environment than good. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, this next question here uh, is from Ann Jordan from Canada. Uh, she, she asks and, and says, uh, the lockdowns, I uh, have proven to stop the rail blockades that we've been experiencing in Canada and those protests, uh, but she fears the doubling down with education and curriculum changes that are occurring. Uh, how do we connect with those who are working on such items? So I guess her, her question is um, from a networking, from a, a facilitating perspective, how can we work together to kind of oppose that uh, educational indoctrination that's really been popping up on all of these issues? Well, you know, and uh, uh, our film, Climate Hustle 2, Rise of the Climate Monarchy, is coming out in a few weeks. It uh, looks like we were originally scheduled for the movie theaters. We're going to be doing an online release. More on that later. But we spend an entire segment in the movie talking about this education system and how it's indoctrinating kids from kindergarten through college. And it is a sight to behold. This is 
the activist agenda who has got hold of these kids has them forming things like polar armies, suing the United States government because they're robbing them of their future for not acting on climate change. Former NASA scientist James Hansen has been involved in these lawsuits. I mean, the kids go to Congress and they testify in favor of the Green New Deal. Or they're on the Capitol Hill, basically saying mom and dad destroyed the planet and they left us the bill. Thanks, mom and dad. It's turning generations against each other. So we have such a heavy workload ahead on, on education. Uh, the, the, in America, at least, education is state by state, county by county. It's not centralized in a lot of ways, although there's curriculum now that's, that's creeping out with the... Uh, uh, the federal education standards, and I, we, we've gone and testified on those, but it's a long, hard battle there, but it's the, probably the most important battle of the climate environmental fight because these kids are being taught uh, essentially to be raised that you know, they need to be climate activists. As Leonardo DiCaprio said, we need to get kids young. Lori David, Al Gore's producer, told kids, I want to make, I, I want to get you and I want you to grow up to be an activist. That's their goal and that's crept through the entire education establishment. Yeah, scientific education is essentially critical thinking. It's employing the scientific method. It is challenging our own theories, doing everything we can to prove them wrong. And if we fail, encouraging others to prove them wrong. And if nobody can prove them wrong, then we think we may be onto something. In today's day and age, unfortunately, people are taught that if you uh, subject a climate change alarmist theory to critical thinking, if you apply the scientific method, you are attacking science. Again, it's just, it's Orwellian how they turn science on their heads. And the problem is children are not being exposed to critical thinking, nor are they being exposed to the fact that the climate alarmist narrative is a prediction based on models. And the models that have been, uh, and the predictions in the models in the past have failed in the real world. As I mentioned, the first United Nations IPCC report predicted 0.3 degrees Celsius of warming each decade. It's been less than that. It's been much closer to what skeptics predicted, and yet we're told that skeptics are attacking and defying science. Uh, the IPCC, in its latest report, in which they discuss uh, extreme weather events and climate conditions, for example, the United Nations IPCC reports it has very low confidence that there's been a connection between climate change and hurricanes, low confidence in the link between climate change and tornadoes, low confidence in climate change but in a link between climate change and droughts. And yet when we have the empirical observations, we're told to ignore them. Children are, being, uh, are, are, are not being uh, exposed to that. Instead, they just get the alarmist predictions. It's a very difficult struggle. Fortunately, we have the internet. Fortunately, we have cable news. Uh, we have cable talk programs. If this were 40 years ago with just three networks and that's it, we'd have no chance of getting the truth out. But as, as much as this is an uphill struggle, I'm optimistic because even with this uphill struggle, and even as it gets worse every day, Congress has not passed cap and trade. Congress has not passed a carbon dioxide tax. Heck, they had majorities and large majorities in both houses of Congress and President Obama in the White House, and they couldn't get it done. So I encourage people not to give up. It's a tough struggle, but I believe the American people are smart. If you present evidence, they'll find the evidence, they'll discern the truth, and ultimately the truth will prevail. Thanks guys. Um, yeah, as our director of collegians, I mean, this is a very pertinent question. You know, it's great points. Um, we, we work every day to try to get young people in on the truth on these subjects. So uh, just a, a short point, I like Jonathan Cook's comment here in the, in the comments, our kids should be suing our government for pre-spending their future. I like that because you have a lot of liberal kids suing the government uh, for climate change. It should be the other way around. He's exactly right. Um, quick note for everybody wondering about uh, climate hustle and you know those things. Uh, this coming uh, week or the next week, we've got a lot of announcements coming on that, on its availability, its release date, everything like that. So stay tuned, cfact.org. We're going to have all those announcements. Um, we'll try to get uh, information to you on that as soon as possible. So uh, moving on to another audience question here. This one is from Ron in California. Um, he says that uh, the impact of the COVID-19 situation on transportation policy uh, to him is a prelude to life with less fossil fuels, which he sees as in many places in the world, or even many states in the country, depending on who's your governor and legislature, um, you know, is something that we may be doomed for if these environmental activists continue to get their way on a state-based level, even though, like you said, James, they haven't 
one completely on a federal level. So he was wondering what changes can we make personally to try to prepare for that? Is that overblown? Um, how can we make the best of that? Prepare for that. I want to fight that. I want to make sure that we have affordable, abundant energy. You know, there's a reason why throughout the world, conventional energy dominates energy production and energy use. Uh, it'd be very difficult to have this grand conspiracy where you have nearly 200 governments getting together and suppressing the most affordable, abundant uh, green energy source, if that were the case. There is a reason why that absent government mandates and subsidies, there's very little uh, wind and solar power. Even with government mandates and subsidies, there's still fairly little uh, wind and solar power throughout the world. The fact of the matter is, if we're looking out for ourselves and if we're looking out more importantly for our children and our future, we are going to be utilizing the energy sources that allow us to have prosperity, that allow us to have more resources available for education, for good health care, uh, for anything that makes life more enjoyable or longer lasting. That's the future we should be fighting for. That's the future the Hong Kong Institute's fighting for. And I'm very grateful that CFACT is as well. Thank you. And I'd like to add one thing. Let's turn the argument around on them. Instead of them using this, and AOC, as I mentioned earlier, is cheering the collapse of you know, oil prices and everything else. Let's turn it around. The, the idea of green living is, not, uh, not, is, is actually antithetical to virus panic and viral fears. Why don't we use the virus fears to oppose their rules? We've always been told, you know, if a driver is going to a lone driver in a car, driving, commuting to and from work, um, is, is bad for the planet and polluting. Well, given in the age of virus scares, and we're all supposed to be terrified of all these viruses now, why would you want to pack on mass transit that's green approved? Why would you want to take the subway system? Why would you want to be on the commuter train when you could take your glorious fossil fueled car in isolation away from the virus? So I would argue, let's turn the fears around uh, you know, where necessary to throw it back at them. And it was actually an article, um, it was actually an article by Michael Barone recently called Anti-Pandemic Rules, uh, the Opposite of Anti-Climate Change Rules. Let's use that against them because they want everyone living in crowded urban areas. Uh, I remember one climate activist years ago wanted everyone, wanted to design cities after termite nests. The idea is, you know, have everything just centrally planned, perfectly smart, smart planned out. Uh, if you now look at it in the lens of the virus scare, which they are promoting shamelessly, that doesn't fly. So let's use their own rhetoric against them. Okay, moving right along. Our next question is from uh, Kevin Mooney, uh, who writes for the Daily Signal of the Heritage Foundation. Uh, he says, we recently lost uh, Freeman Dyson and Fred Singer, uh, just as coronavirus erupted uh, to excellent scientists. Uh, what opportunity do we have to elevate the real science behind CO2 as they do? Well, first of all, neither one of those, I just want to be clear, I don't, neither one of them died from uh, COVID-19. That, that, you know, just in case there was any, any confusion on that, it, they died of, yeah, yeah, after living long, happy lives. Um, yes, I mean, both of them, Fred Singer was the, literally the pioneer. I remember years ago when I was working in the United States Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, when I was reaching out to scientists, so many of them would just cite Fred Singer made them look into the climate science. Fred Singer made them revisit it. Fred Singer was like the most important pioneering man in the last 25 years, the godfather of the climate change skepticism. And Freeman Dyson, you know, sitting in the chair, the same chair that Einstein sat in, uh, you know, the chair at Princeton, uh, you know, is just phenomenal when you hear him talk. In the 1970s, he competed uh, you know, with, the, with the, the data versus the climate modelers for funding. And he said the climate modelers won the funding. And it goes to a lot of what James was talking about earlier, how that, you know, the models are so poorly done, but this is what drives the entire climate change narrative because you can always misdirect. Current reality fails to alarm. Let's use the models to make scarier and scarier predictions. Uh, we lost two great names. Uh, luckily, we still have many more to go forward. Uh, for Kevin's question, I would say let's look to Will Happer uh, and, and many others like him who are standing up. Will Happer was, of course, Trump's science advisor who just recently left the administration. But, you know, what we really needed from the Trump administration, to, to, I, I'm, just, I, I'm hoping it happens in a second term, if there's a second term, is a presidential climate committee, commission, whatever you want to call it, 
which would be, you know, essentially commission and have bring over some of the top names in climate science to actually for the first time challenge the United Nations and the National Climate Assessment, the abomination by uh, Catherine Hayhoe, Don Wobbles of the, of the um, uh, Union of Concerned Scientists, and it was actually orchestrated by uh, Obama's lead UN Paris negotiator, just steeped in politics. It was a crap report that every Trump administration cabinet rubber stamped because they didn't want to be seen as censoring. The National Climate Assessment never should have happened. I don't know. We need, you know, this is, we need to really push back hard. And I, I just don't know that a, a Trump administration is going to do any kind of commission in a second term if they get one. But, but we've got to keep up this fight. And there's a lot of younger scientists coming on as well. Uh, as they get older, they're more likely to speak out. Young scientists are intimidated, obviously. Yeah, Dr. Fred Singer's passing uh, was just heartbreaking. He was such a giant in science. Uh, I mean, really one of the great scientific minds of the 20th century and the 21st century. And it was very sad to see how when he pointed out some problems with climate alarmism, how he was vilified personally. Um, it's amazing how often folks on the climate left try to make it seem like skeptics are horrible, rotten people that are always attacking scientists personally. And some of the attacks that they make on Fred Singer and others are just deplorable. Uh, besides that, Hal Doron, who was part of the right climate stuff team, he just passed away this past week and a tremendous loss for those who've been to the Heartland Institute's International Conference on Climate Change events. Hal was a frequent speaker, uh, just a wonderful person and one of, the, one of the most intelligent people you will ever meet, another great science mind. It was because of his vision, his hope, his aspirations for humanity that we were able to put a man on the moon and bring him back. This is a great mind. These are people with incredibly brilliant minds that are calling into question climate alarmism. And they cannot be dismissed just by calling them names or calling them cracks or whatever else. Um, moving forward, you know, Bill Gray, Bob Carter, others. What's really, troubling is that it's very difficult for younger scientists to speak out because if they do so, they will be vilified. They will have a very difficult time finding employment. If they have employment with the university and don't have tenure, they'll have a very difficult time keeping their employment. Ask Susan Crockford. Uh, there are many others. And as we move forward, unfortunately, as much as uh, the children are being indoctrinated today with just one side of the question, there will be fewer and fewer voices in the science world speaking out, not because there are fewer and fewer true scientists who challenge and question the climate alarmist theory, but because there are fewer people who will be able to do so and still live a semblance of a life and have a semblance of a career. And hopefully we will be able to change that just by continuing to spread the truth about the science and about what's happening to scientists who speak out and speak as yeah, I just want to add in my book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Climate Change, I go through a whole chapter on all the scientists who finally speak out and who, many who reverse themselves. But one of the, the first woman PhD meteorologists worked at NASA, Dr. Joanne Simpson. She was silent and she actually quote after she retired is now that I'm retired, I can finally say it. I'm a skeptic. The first woman PhD meteorologist who went through all of that achievement knew she couldn't speak out while she was still as a federal government scientist. She waited until she retired. Another one named uh, uh, Sonsis from University of Wisconsin recently came out and announced he was a skeptic. So the good news is, and, and you'll see people like Bill Nye say, oh, when all these old skeptics die, that'll be good. You know, essentially, there won't be any more skepticism. Wrong. All the younger skeptics who then end up retiring will start speaking out, who couldn't speak out from the universities or as federal scientists. So the waves will keep coming. And yes, the skeptical scientists will probably skew older always because they, they're not able to speak out while they're active scientists uh, in their careers in either academia or in uh, the federal service. Great points, guys. Amen to all that. We've got time for a few more questions here. Uh, so I'm going to try to do my best to get to as many as I can. Um, this next question is from Sally Baptiste, um, and she says, China doesn't really care about the climate at all, but the environmentalists never really say anything about that. Will China ever care about the environment? Uh, will environmentalists ever wake up to what they're doing? They consume more energy than any other country uh, and have very high pollution levels. No, I would just add that China 
is is masterful with this. They, you know, they they always love the United Nations climate treaties. They love it because it never punishes them. My favorite was how they agreed to the UN Paris commitment, which is act exactly matched their trajectory of peak uh, industrial activity and CO2 and then a stabilization. So they basically just pledged to what, what they were already going to do. Uh, and with it, what's interesting about uh, the China right now is they are just they're, they're, of course, reeling from the coronavirus situation, and we don't know what to believe there. But the left enamoration, being enamored with China, I think it was um, Tom Friedman, the New York Times, actually said the one-party rule means China can just do the right thing. Christina Figueres, the former UN climate chief, has praised China as well. There's a love affair with that idea that the one-party rule doesn't have all this dissent, doesn't have to deal with evil climate deniers. They can just do what they want. And it's frightening because when you have people calling for centralized transformation and using China as the model, you can see where they want to go. Permanent lockdowns, you know, police hassling you. You know, if you, again, Dames alluded to it earlier, the, the Wisconsin mother who the police were hassling, you know, this is the new America. Just watch some of these videos of local police departments in action and ask yourself if you want to live in this America for another 15 minutes like this. It's time to do something not hold up China as a model, not uh, hold up China as the, the right way to do things, which so many on the left have just fallen into. Even to one point, Andrew Revkin of the New York Times, former New York Times reporter, chastised his own colleagues on the left and said, you know, this isn't, essentially this isn't good optics for you to be ch praising China like that. Right, and uh, it is the climate left and uh, emphasis on the term left. So when you have, you know, there's a reason why there's a political divide on, on the climate change issue. It's a science issue and yet it breaks down according to ideological and party lines. The reason being, if you're a conservative, therefore you're more likely to be a Republican. But if you're a conservative and you see these proposed solutions that restrict individual freedom, that are collectivist, that give more power to government and take away our rights as individuals, you're not as concerned about that if you're a liberal than if you're a conservative. If you're, if you're conservative, you're going to say, yeah, if the world is, is, is frying, yeah, we need to do something. But let's look under the hood and make sure that the science justifies it, because I've seen this song and dance before where these are the proposed solutions. So getting back to China and the left, yes, yeah, so many people in the climate establishment, they're climate left, so they go out of their way to give China a pass, so that China doesn't need to reduce emissions. China leads the world in terms of renewable energy equipment, wind and solar equipment they produce. And yet they utilize so much more coal than the United States does because they're not so stupid as to utilize the equipment that would drive up their energy prices and make energy less abundant. That they're willing to make a profit selling, us to, selling that equipment to dupes in the West who have their renewable power mandates and subsidies, but they don't use it themselves. And one other point though is, should we really be scolding them for that? I mean, when we look at the evidence, we see that warming temperatures and affordable energy use with the uh, carbon dioxide emissions have improved uh, the, the social welfare, the health and welfare of individuals throughout the world. So should we really be pressuring China to reduce their emissions? But if we do believe in a climate crisis, if the climate left is going to be pressing this, yes, it is hypocritical in China and casting the United States as the villain, even though we've reduced emissions in this country more than any other country in the world throughout this century. Uh, and by the way, just real quick, I was just going to uh, show you the couple of the key quotes here. This is one UN climate chief Christana, Christiana Figueres laments US democracy is very detrimental, lauds one party rule in China for doing it right on climate. This is some of the, uh, and I'm trying to find the, another quote there from Tom Friedman, but, but that's just the idea. The left is enamored with it. Yeah, great points, guys. Great points. These emissions this century, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but it roughly tripled. It could be, you know, off a little bit one direction or the other, but they've gone up dramatically while U.S. emissions have gone down. And there you have Christiana Figueres saying, praising China, they're doing it right, the U.S. is doing it wrong. It's not about climate change. It's not about emissions reductions. It's about imposing socialism on those countries of the world that still respect and value individual freedoms. Absolutely. And so the, current chief, the current chief of the UN is, uh, how do you say his name, Gutierrez. He's a former socialist international or a top party leader there, uh, which is just incredible. Most people don't realize that. So when he makes all these pronouncements, this is an out and out about socialists just you know, speaking and the media never mentions that. 
Absolutely. So we've got, I think, time for two more questions. So I'm going to do two more questions here, if that works for you guys. Uh, the, uh, the, I'm going to go with, go with um, uh, we've got a question from Kevin Hoare here. Uh, he says he's a, a comms pro out here, communications pro out here in Oregon. Uh, and he's concerned that his words, our incompetent, corrupt leftist governor is going to avoid lifting all the current lockdown restrictions and use the crisis to alter how the government works, uh, force Republicans into supporting cap and trade plan. What's the best, best way we can explain this to the public without sounding like conspiracy theorists or opponents of the fight on the virus? Well, I would just say this, you know, it's leadership stop starts at the top. President Trump today tweeted that Sweden is wrong and uh, went against Sweden's policy. Sweden has not done a lockdown, allowed kids to go to school, restaurants, movie theaters open. I think we have to acknowledge at a national level that lockdowns, there's no science to support uh, essentially that their that their work, especially I can understand a flattening the curve or some kind of limited, very limited, but you don't like that. We have to acknowledge that they're wrong and not allow future lockdowns. That's number one. Number two is they are absolutely, the governors all over the place and legislators that, that are, that see fit to this now want to rebuild. They've just tanked the economy and now they want to rebuild it in their image. So the way to rebuild this is you can't allow them, you know, to have this kind of power and you got to fight it tooth and nail. My way of fighting it is this, and I, you know, I'm going to advocate absolute breaking of the law tonight. If you have people going to the beach and getting arrested, it's easy for police to show up, arrest a few people or go to a park and arrest someone. But if people start showing up en masse to the beach, the police can't arrest everyone. And if you start having owners of businesses start, to, and we're seeing this now, artists and other shops declaring themselves tailor shops, declaring themselves non-essential, they're opening up. More of them do it. The police can't arrest everyone. This is my key thought. The Berlin Wall was not taken down because the East German government passed a law that said, let's remove the law. It came down because the people no longer gave their consent for a wall to be up. So when the people no longer give their consent through lockdown, through this kind of mass civil disobedience, that's how you fight it. Not through calling your congressman or senator and, 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 and complaining into a voicemail. You've got to act. And I think that's what has to happen here. Sorry, I'm, I'm calling for law breaking tonight. Yeah, and the question brings up these government uh, restrictions. And remember, this, this is a bait and switch at the expense of our most important and basic freedoms. We were told that we needed these lockdowns until we flattened the curve so that we wouldn't overwhelm hospitals and healthcare providers. And that if we flatten the curve, we wouldn't, again, we wouldn't be reducing the overall number of cases. We wouldn't be reducing the number of deaths but other than preventing some unnecessary deaths because nobody could get into a hospital or see a healthcare uh, a, a person. Now that we've done this, now that, now that the curve is flattened, still we see, as Mark uh, mentioned, we've got in California now new restrictions. You can't go to the beach. Restrictions that continue to exist and are becoming worse in some places, even when the justification that was initially given has gone away. If you want to justify it by a certain uh, a certain excuse, a certain rationale, present it. And if you want to change it, tell us you're going to change it and give us the opportunity to voice our concerns. And when people are rising up around the country, this is indicative of Americans as a whole understanding that government is out of control. People are wise. People understand. When I, I took my dogs for a walk, two thirds of the people driving in their cars by themselves alone with their windows. We trust people to make their own decisions about the steps we're going to take to safeguard ourselves. And we've already gotten through the worst part that was used to justify the lockdowns. So let's allow people to make their own decisions about their own lives and their own freedoms. We have that information. Everybody who would like to self-quarantine can do so. And I'd like to add the UK Telegraph had a fantastic article, Two New Waves of Deaths. This is on April 25th. And there it is. This is the, this is the study. Second wave is already breaking. It's made up of non-coronavirus patients not able or willing to access health care because of the crisis. Based on the data, estimates of deaths now total 10,000 and are running at 2,000 a week. These are cancer patients, heart attack victims, other people increase, whether you're talking suicides. Imagine all the people with addictions and not being able to go to Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. There are so many other 
things to consider besides saving every life possible with a with a virus scare that these lockdowns uh, have done. So uh, all I can say here is just this has to be fought. This is the future of you know the fight for liberty. Now it's going to be against these lockdowns and against this because these gov- these governors have tasted what petty dictatorship feels like, and they're not going to want to relinquish it. By the worst example being the governor of. Uh, Michigan, but also New York City Mayor de Blasio. I mean, incredible uh, how he specifically targeted the Jewish community and and actually had the the one funeral broken up. And he actually did a tweet that said, my message to the Jewish community. I mean, he may may as well have had a German accent when he said it. It's getting scary. The governors here uh, uh, and the mayors, how they're just reveling in this power. Thanks for that, guys. So, um... Uh, there's one question that I can answer uh, my own, a question from Helen uh, Lindquist. Uh, will this session be on YouTube? Yes, absolutely it will be. Um, so if there's anything you want to recap, uh, that'll be posted on, I believe, both the Heartland and the CFAC uh, pages. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, and our last uh, question, and this has been asked by, by several people, um, by several people, including uh, Rod Stewart, uh, Danny Hozak, and others. Um, what are your opinions on Moore's new movie, Planet of the Humans? And what impact do you think that's going to have on this greater environmental issue, environmental movement? What are the pros of the movie? What are the cons of the movie? Um, what do you see about that? Well, I'll just give a quick answer here. As Michael Moore's movie uh, is, is just an unbelievable attack on the un, untouchable climate community. It's so so devastating that Michael Mann, the climate gate professor at Penn State, Josh Fox of Gasland, the horrible movie, all the distortions, they've been leading this drive, petitions, trying to get the distributor to pull the movie. Uh, Michael Moore takes a just brutal look at renewable energy. Now, he is horrible on climate alarmism, and he is horrible on population, basically saying we need less people. So he fails all of that, but that's the usual stuff. And a lot of people are very upset that some skeptics are promoting Michael Moore's film, but they're not mentioning that. Well, I'm mentioning it now. Yeah, he's a climate alarmist and he's an overpopulation you know, fear monger and all that without basis. But you have to remove that because that's what we'd expect from Michael Moore. You've got to highlight the unexpected. And the unexpected is showing clips of Al Gore and Richard Branson belly laughing when they're asked if Al Gore is a prophet. And Richard Branson says, it depends how you spell the word prophet. And they're talking about the Obama stimulus, $90 billion, and all the money Al Gore's raking up, and all the money, all these climate activists. And he goes after Bill McKibben. These are the sacred cows of the climate community. So I, 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 you know, on one hand, yeah, it's the, it's the usual tripe from climate alarmists, but that's the usual stuff. That's not news. Let's focus on this. Let's embrace the aspects of Michael Moore. I hope to see Michael Moore on Fox News. Michael Schellenberger was a big Green New Deal advocate 10 years ago. He's now appearing on Tucker Carlson and other conservative shows, and he's telling his story. He's now no longer, I would call him, no longer a climate alarmist at all. He's very, you know, he believes in a, not a climate crisis, but he's a believer in global warming. But he is, lays waste to the same kind of claims and does it the same way Michael Moore did in his film. So we need to embrace these as allies, not alienate them. I frankly want to welcome Michael Moore for this message and work with him on this because he's not going to have many friends after this. People were in tears on Twitter saying, you used to be my hero. Now I've given up on you. I mean, the left is just completely disowning Michael Moore as we speak. I, I never thought I would be encouraging people to watch Michael Moore films. I never thought the day would come, but everybody here should watch it. And if you've already watched it, you should watch that film again. One of the things that, that I try to hold myself to, and I hope I'm doing this, and I hope I always will, is to have an open mind. If the information, if the data changed, that I would have the courage to say that. Um, I haven't seen that information. I haven't seen anything that makes me say, you know what, I was wrong. I gave you the best opinion I could, uh, looking at the evidence we had. Now, the information, the evidence Mm -hmm. is Michael Moore came into the, the filming of his movie with one particular mindset, expecting to make a particular kind of movie. He made a different movie because he had an open enough mind to, uh, to accept the truth and, and to challenge his own convictions. Michael Moore has a t- completely different vision of what government should be about collectivism versus individual rights. It is completely different to what I believe in. Nevertheless, I respect the fact 
that he is able to keep an open mind. And when he says, wait a second, something just changed my view on this, uh, that he was bold enough to go out there, courageous enough to do it, knowing he would get the heat for doing it. The film is available on YouTube, Planet of the Humans. Anyone can watch it. It's free. I encourage everyone to do it. And it also calls to mind regarding the coronavirus connection with climate change. Back seven weeks ago, when we were told a million, two million deaths, those were the types of, of pronouncements from medical experts that had people like myself legitimately thinking, okay, we have to do whatever we can reasonably do to save lives, to take the measures that we can to blunt this. We can't have another 1918 Spanish flu. We can't have a black plague. But as we get more information, we see it's still going to be tragic. There's nothing we can do to stop the coronavirus from spreading, from taking lives. But we also realize it's not nearly as deadly as we were first fearing. And therefore we have to, again, take that new information like Michael Moore did on, on the particular topic of wind and solar power, and then reassess, are we doing the right thing? Are these policies the right thing? And we can have disagreements and those disagreements don't make people on the other side bad people. There are many people who greatly fear uh, catching coronavirus and they support the lockdowns because they, that's what they value. It doesn't make them horrible people, the, the people who are legitimately taking that point of view. The same on the other side. If you believe that human freedom, if you believe that an economy that allows people to prosper is something valuable, that doesn't make you a bad person. There's a reason why the history textbooks that we read when we were in middle school and high school, they had long sections on the Great Depression, but very little on the Spanish flu because the Great Depression, it, uh, inflicted a more serious toll on human health and welfare. Anyway, these are the types of things that all mesh together. Michael Moore's done a fantastic job. I congratulate you on your courage. Who knows, maybe we'll find more topics that we can agree on. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for those answers. Uh, I echo that, you know, uh, watch it on YouTube before the left, uh, you know, succeeds with Google uh, in censoring that film. Um, for everyone who tuned in to watch us and submit a question. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you to Mark and James, our panelists, for uh, participating in this. We're looking forward to more talks like this going forward. We're excited about that. Uh, for everyone who wants to continue this conversation, there's a lot of questions we didn't get to. I apologize for that. We only had so much time. Tried to get to as many as I could. Uh, I, I asked about half the questions I had to get to all your guys' questions. Um, so, to continue that conversation, look Heartland, look CFACT up on social media, look Mark up on social media at, uh, at Climate Depot, um, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, it's all there. You know, we have a continuing conversation with that. We'd love to continue to engage with you. So um, with that, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, stay free. And, uh, you know, we'll uh, continue to push for freedom in every way that we can. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, James and Adam. Thank you all. Thank you.